This is Kennedy Classics with Dr. D. James Kennedy. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jerry Newcomb. And I'm Jennifer Cassidy. Over the past century, many scientists have divorced themselves from God and taught us that we're merely evolutionary accidents, the happy coincidence of time plus chance plus matter. And that view of humanity has had devastating consequences. On today's program, we'll look into the danger that can result when this evolutionary view, which makes mankind nothing more than matter in motion, combines with government force. And we'll fill you in on a hazardous current government project and give you the opportunity to make your voice heard on the matter. And I'm John Sorensen. Later in the program, I'll share with you a resource for living out God's design for you. And as we begin today's program, my father, the late Dr. D. James Kennedy, shows us how science was hijacked by those who claimed human beings are merely cosmic accidents, and how the truth is now emerging in his classic message, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the 139th Psalm. Psalm 139, we shall begin our reading with the seventh verse. May we hear the inspired word of the living God. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And may God speak to us today from his holy word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. Today I would like to tell you about something that I sincerely doubt that a handful of you have ever heard of before. Something which is of enormous consequence and of great importance. It is a scientific discovery which indeed impacts strongly upon our faith, and it has been described by a scientist as one which is to be ranked with the greatest achievements in the history of science. The discovery rivals those of Newton and Einstein, Lavoisier and Schrodinger, Pasteur and Darwin. It is a discovery which is as momentous as the observation that the earth goes around the sun or that disease is caused by bacteria or that radiation is emitted in quanta. And what is this incredible discovery? It is, and I quote from <clears throat> Professor Dr. Michael Behe, who is a microbiologist, a biochemist at Lehigh University. <clears throat> and he says in a marvelous book, which I am very indebted to for uh, this <clears throat> message, he says this. He says, what was discovered 
is that at its base, life is composed of machines. A rather astounding discovery that at our foundational level, and he's talking about the level within the cell, at the molecular level, we are made of machines. Not one or two or 10 or a thousand or a million, but trillions of machines. And we have about a trillion machines in every one of our three trillion cells. And yet it's all made, not of metal or plastic, but it's made of living tissue, largely protein, in all different shapes and forms. And it is a fascinating thing to see. Now, this discovery was made because of technological advances in microscopes. In Darwin's day, the microscopes were pretty weak, and uh, so he thought of the cell something like a, ping, a small ping pong ball with a, a pea in it. In fact, it's interesting that the key, the key to persuading people of evolution was the portrayal of cells as simple because the whole thrust of evolution is movement from the simple to the complex. And therefore, it had to begin with what Darwin repeatedly called a simple, single cell. And that's what enabled him to convince the scientific world of uh, the possibilities of evolution. Now, in the last decade or so since this discovery has been made, there have been thousands of articles, scientific papers, books that have been written about it to other scientists describing this astonishing Lilliputian world of millions, trillions of machines. But he began to make a computer search of all of the books, of all of the reports, of all of the scientific conventions, of all of the various articles that had been written to find something that at least attempted to explain where that mind-boggling complexity came from at the very rock bottom level of our existence. And he says, there was a strange and eerie silence. Thousands of articles talking about it, not one attempting even to explain it. It is beyond the ability of evolutionary science because they are irreducibly complex. He uses a very, very simple illustration of what is meant by irreducible. That means some kind of a machine that has a number of different interrelated parts where if you remove any one of them, the machine won't work at all. And that's what these machines are. He gives as a simple illustration a mousetrap which is made up of about six or seven little pieces. We're all familiar what they are. It's irreducible because if you remove any one of them, you won't simply catch fewer mice, you won't catch any mice at all. And that's what these machines are. There is no way that they could have built up from something simple. That, dear friend, is what you are. There are more machines inside of you than in all of the factories of the world combined. Yes, indeed, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, it is interesting that Darwin said in his book, he knew the 
theory of gradual evolution by natural selection carried a heavy burden. And this is what he said. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would be abundant, would absolutely rather break down. Dr. Behe says that this discovery of irreducible complexity at the very base of life meets that criterion and thus breaks down, completely destroys the theory of evolution and the conclusion, he says, as we reach the end of this book, we are left with no substantive defense against what feels to be a strange conclusion that life was designed by an intelligent agent. And the simple single cell that Darwin postulated and that modern science sought has proven to be a phantom instead. And in place of that, he says they find systems of horrendous, irreducible complexity that inhabit the cell. People sometimes ask if, if God has a sense of humor. I think he does. And people set out to prove that there was no God and that life is the result of merely naturalistic and materialistic causes. God looked down at one of the three trillion cells in your body, each inhabited by a trillion complex machines. And he looked into those, that machinery and he smiled and he said, <laughs> wait till they get a look at this. May we pray. Father, we thank thee that thou that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh at the ungodly who seek to remove you from the very world that you created and who though themselves made by your hand deny thy, their maker and seek to bring others to disbelief. We pray, O oh Lord, that this marvelous discovery will take its place in the list of vastly important discoveries of the past and the full spiritual and religious significance of it will begin to be understood and people will see that the greatest scientific statement about origins that has ever been made is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and we are fearfully and wonderfully made. In thy name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer and meant it from your heart, then let me be the first to say, welcome to the family of God. To help you learn more about the decision that you've just made today, we'd like to send you the book, Beginning Again, written by Dr. Kennedy. In these pages, you'll learn how to pray, how to read and study the Bible, God's instruction manual for living, and even how to find answers to some tough questions you may have. To receive your copy, just write to our address or call our toll-free number. God bless you as you begin your new life in Christ. As you've just seen, human beings are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has carefully created us in His own image, which gives each of us worth and value just because we're human, regardless of our abilities or position. 
When that idea is lost, people are treated like commodities. And this month on our program, we've been alerting you to the provision in Obamacare which will allow the government to make drastic cuts in health care for seniors based on their perceived worth. Our own Dr. Jerry Newcomb and John Rabe have more. This year, penalties under the Obamacare individual mandate for not having insurance will go into effect. At the same time, a number of constitutional and legal challenges to Obamacare are still making their way through the courts. And perhaps most troubling of all, the unelected Independent Payment Advisory Board is to begin its work cutting Medicare costs without congressional oversight in 2015. John Rabe joins me to discuss the latest on Obamacare. John, welcome. Thank you for having me, Jerry. So, tell us about the individual mandate and the penalties. Yes, the individual mandate was obviously that very uh, controversial provision in Obamacare that requires every citizen to buy health care coverage, to buy health care insurance. And that's really the only way the plan can work is if they can get money out of everybody in order to do it. So 2014 was the first year that that was in effect. Anybody who did not have health care insurance in 2014 will be penalized on their tax return when they go to file in April. They will have to pay as much as 1% of their income uh, in penalty for not having it. In 2015, that penalty actually goes up to 2% of income for most people. And uh, so again, these penalties are in place. For the first time in history, you have the federal government requiring its citizens to purchase a product. And if they fail to purchase that product, they are hit with taxes and fines. Suppose somebody didn't want to pay that penalty or even couldn't afford to pay that penalty, they couldn't possibly go to jail for that, could they? It's certainly possible. I mean, what happens when you don't give the IRS the money that they say that you owe them? Uh, it doesn't begin with jail, but it ultimately does end there. I don't think we're going to see a huge raft of people suddenly going to jail over this, but it is a tax despite the fact that the Supreme Court fallaciously ruled that it wasn't in order to uphold its constitutionality. It is a tax and the same thing that happens when you don't pay the rest of your taxes will apply if you don't pay your tax here. You will buy health insurance or you will pay the penalty. It seems like the government is intruding in more and more of our lives and this is an incredible example of that. In fact, Ken Klukowski, who's an attorney, and an analyst had this to say about Obamacare. The reality is it creates a system of, of government controls over the entire healthcare industry and every provider, which includes the ability of, of the government to be able to set who is eligible to receive certain benefits. Now, the reality is that's not about healthcare per se, that's about control. And ultimately, the question is who lives, who dies, and who decides? Well, we've been talking about the Independent Payment Advisory Board all this month on the program. It's an aspect of Obamacare. It kicks in this year. John, tell us what this panel is for those not familiar with it. Sure. When you talk about control, this is certainly an aspect of control. The Independent Payment Advisory Board, or IPAB, is a 15-member unelected commission that will make decisions on cuts in Medicare. John, I understand the decisions made by that panel cannot be appealed. No, that's what's most chilling about it. Congress has abdicated its oversight. They've said you are independent, and so they don't have oversight from Congress, and there's no judicial review on these things. Once they make decisions, it's basically final. An unelected panel of people saying a, an entire swath of people will not receive a certain kind of treatment or a certain kind of health care, that should be frightening to all of us. So it's sort of a one-size-fits-all this is what happens when government bureaucracy takes over our health care system. Here's Father Frank Pavone of Priests for Life. Government bureaucrats are going to make calculations and decide whether this particular life is worth additional treatment or additional money. All in the effort to reduce cost, what we're doing now is compromising the integrity of the decision-making process for the good of the patient. The administration and its supporters deny this, but this was a very telling exchange in 2009 between President Obama and a woman who asked if her 105-year-old mother, who got a pacemaker at 99 and was still living a good full life, would have gotten that treatment. His response? What we can do is make sure that at least some of the waste that exists in the system that's not making anybody's mom better uh, that is loading up on additional tests or additional drugs 
that the evidence shows is not necessarily going to improve care, that at least we can let doctors know and your mom know that, you know what, maybe this isn't going to help. Maybe you're better off uh, not having the surgery but taking uh, the painkiller. Well, John, what do you make of this? Well, I think it's a very telling quote, Jerry, because you have to remember the context in which he's answering this question. A woman is asking a very specific question about her elderly mother who got a treatment that helped extend her life and she's still productive. As is often the case when asked a very direct question and a pertinent question like that, what the president actually does is obfuscate. There's sort of a fog of words that even seem self-contradictory at a certain point. And when you really look at it in the context of the question that was asked, the answer is nonsense. He's not merely saying that doctors will be able to tell their patients, you know, I don't think the treatment will really work for you. You'd be better off with the medication. Doctors have always been able to tell their patients that. That's not any sort of change in the status quo. What's actually new here and what he's trying to avoid saying, but what he's inevitably saying anyway, is that doctors would tell them, this treatment will not be effective for you. You're going to take the painkillers instead. He's talking about a denial of treatment, but he knows the political import of that, so he doesn't want to come right out and say it. See, this involves the loss of freedom because basically it's the government taking over our health care and deciding who gets the treatment and who doesn't and using even artificial age limits and so forth saying you know after this certain age nobody should get treated beyond palliative care which is what he's saying there that's right and one of the defenses of the independent payment advisory board has been well they're not going to make individualized decisions they're going to make overall policy decisions well the question again then is if you're making overall policy decisions how are you going to treat people who are in their 80s how are you going to treat people who are in their 90s if you can't individualize it, if a doctor can't look at a patient and say, this person has a great quality of life, this person has a real shot to have a good extension of life with this treatment, if the doctor is no longer free to say that because of cuts that have been made in Medicare, then essentially what we've said is that people who are elderly, people who are in a situation that we don't deem worth living, aren't worth helping. That's chilling and that should be the last thing that we as a people want to do. So what can we do about this? Jerry, the most important thing right now is to hold Congress's feet to the fire. We have a new Congress that was just installed in January, just elected in November of 2014. And the reality is a huge number of those who were newly elected were newly elected because of opposition to Obamacare nationwide. Explicitly. That's right, they, they campaigned on the issue. Unfortunately, however, as soon as they take office, you know how things begin to change. We received a great disappointment with the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Act that was supposed to have a vote the week of the Roe v. Wade anniversary in January. Mm -hmm. this, this passed the Republican House only two years ago, and now in a more Republican House, they refused to bring it to a vote themselves without any opposition. It would have easily passed, it would have easily gone on to the Senate, and instead they chickened out and decided not even to take the vote, having more power in the House of Representatives. It shows us once again, it's not that elections are useless, it's not that the whole process is just pointless, but it does mean that once they're elected, their feet have to be held to the fire. We need to do the same thing when it comes to Obamacare. If your representative, if your senator ran opposing Obamacare, you need to make sure that they stay true to their word. Great point. Now here's an interesting quote. Guess who said this? IPAB will be able to stop certain treatments its members do not favor by simply setting rates to levels where no doctor or hospital will perform them. The answer is Dr. Howard Dean, a physician and former chairman of the Democratic Party. So you see, this is not a partisan issue. It's an issue of caring for those who are most vulnerable among us, a biblical principle, and keeping an ever-growing bureaucratic leviathan under control. John, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Jerry. The overwhelming majority of the American people were against Obamacare when it was passed by the Senate late in the night by a partisan majority in late 2009. In fact, since that night, fully half of the senators who voted in favor of it are no longer in the Senate just five years later. But while many of the senators are gone, the law lives on. And its most frightening provision, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, what's been called the death panel, is still part of the law and could begin making cuts this year. 
This panel must be stopped. The outlook of the Congress is much different than it was in 2009, and it's time to make them hear your voice loud and clear. We've put together a petition calling upon the new Congress to repeal the Independent Payment Advisory Board. Contact us to receive your petition, sign it, and return it so that your leaders in Congress will hear your voice and the voices of other concerned Christians around the country on the death panels. Simply write to us at Box 6085, Albert Lee, Minnesota 56007, or call toll free 888-334-9762, or go online to djameskennedy.org. This may be our last and best chance to get something done about the deeply unpopular National Health Plan. Many new senators and representatives made it to Congress because of national concern over Obamacare, as one promise after another, like, if you like your current plan, you can keep your plan, have been shown to be lies. Make sure they hear from you on this. And when you contact us for your petition, if you include a generous donation of any amount to the ongoing work of our ministry, we'll also send you the powerful short book, The Obamacare Death Panel the powerful unelected board that threatens your health care by John Amon. John worked closely with my father for many years, and he has carefully researched this eye-opening and disturbing expose about the dangers posed by IPAB. We'll send it to you as our way of saying thank you for your generous donation of any amount. Simply write to us at Box 6085, Albert Lee, Minnesota 56007, or call toll free 888-334-9762 or go online to djameskennedy.org. You know how it is. Once government programs are in place, inertia takes over and they become permanent. They're very difficult to dismantle. That's why the time to act is right now, before the death panel starts making its cuts. Congress must hear from all of us before it's too late. Thank you for joining us for today's program. May God bless you as you defend life and stand up for the most vulnerable among us. And may God bless America. Today's program is available on DVD or audio CD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. Next week on Kennedy Classics. The Bible is the most astonishing and incredible book in the entire history of the human race. As soon as I was named, even before I was elected, the battle started. Dr. Moeller's commitment to reforming the seminary ignited a firestorm of protest among students and faculty. That's next week. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.